Psalm 4. <clears throat> to the chief musician on Neganoth, a psalm of David. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing, Selah? But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still, Selah. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There will be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this passage of scripture that we're looking at this evening, Lord, as we think of this fourth psalm and how uh, David there is still facing the enemy, but he's steadfast in his faith. He's not letting go. He's still holding on to the Lord and still holding on to his faith and uh, going forward and trusting in you. I pray, Lord, as we think of the different trials that we go through in life, as we think of the difficulties we face, I just pray, Lord, that you help us, Lord, to have that same steadfastness that regardless of what our circumstances are, that we'll trust you and live for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> this evening we're picking up where we left off last week. Last week we were in Psalm 3 and we saw in the title that Psalm 3 was written when David fled from Absalom his son. Absalom had raised a rebellion against him and David fled from Jerusalem and climbed up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. And when the day was over, they crossed over the Jordan River. And at some point, he must have had a rest because he says in Psalm 3, I laid me down and slept. I awaked for the Lord sustained me. And so that's when he wrote Psalm 3. Well, it's believed that these next two Psalms, Psalm 4 and Psalm 5, are still written at the same time. I believe uh, that Psalm 4 was written at the end of the next day, when he then is going to bed that night, going to sleep that night. They call it the song of the evening. He's now gone into Mahanaim, and he's there, met some friends there, knowing that the battle is going to be the next day. And you can read in 2 Samuel chapter, I think it's 16, how some men brought him beds and basins and all these different th supplies and they had a rest there, and then the next morning he woke up and he wrote Psalm 5, is what is believed. And uh, the Bible doesn't tell us when Psalm 4 and 5 were written, but looking at them, they all seem to go together. So it seems to make sense that they were written at the same time with the same event. And this Psalm, Psalm 4, I call this one the Psalm of the Steadfast. You say, Pastor Luke, why did you spell it S-T-E-D-F-A-S-T? -E -S -T? Ethan came to my office and he said, Daddy, why is there a red line under steadfast? I said, well, because that's how the Bible spells it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. <laughs> Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, I don't know. Maybe it's just I had the American spelling on and this is Canadian. I don't know. It's hard to tell. But... Um, David's circumstances haven't changed in this psalm. The enemy is still coming. Absalom still has his great numbers. Absalom still is out to get him. And one might say it's time to quit. Time to give in. Know when you don't have what, you, what it takes. Know when it's time to throw in the towel. But David in Psalm 4, we see his steadfastness. He refuses to quit. Refuses to give in. And uh, in this psalm, we see why that is. And I just have three things this, this evening. I don't know how long those three things will take to say, but uh, just three things for David as we see his steadfastness. And the first one is we see his grounds for prayer. They say, David, you got to give in. 
Well, in this psalm, we see his reasons for pressing on. And first of all, we see his grounds for prayer. And the enemy is pursuing him. What's he going to do? Well, first, he's going to pray. That's what we always got to do. There's always more you can do after you pray. But there's nothing you can do until you pray. Pray first. Give it to the Lord first. And we saw last week how in Psalm 3, the, the enemy was saying, there's no, help for, of, there's no help for him in God. They're saying God isn't on his side. God's not going to help him. Even God has forsaken him. But David says, no, I'm still going to pray. The Lord is still for me. God still hears and answers my prayer. And the devil wants us to think the same thing. He wants us to think that God doesn't care about us. God's not on your side. God's not interested in you. But you read through the Bible and you find a God that encourages his people to pray. He's never inconvenienced by our prayers. He's always calling on us to pray to him. And so we see the grounds for his prayer. You might think, why is it? How can I be so sure that God will hear my prayer? Have you ever thought that? You think like, <laughs> yes, I know that George Mueller prayed and they say that all of heaven got down and put their ears down to the window of heaven and listened as George Mueller said his prayers, but I'm not George Mueller. I know that the Apostle Paul prayed and saw great and mighty things, but I'm not the Apostle Paul. I don't know how I can be so sure that I can be someone of prayer. Well, David says, here's some reasons why you can be sure you can pray. What's the grounds for our calling on the Lord? Well, the first one is God's salvation. God's salvation. Notice what David says in verse 1. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. That's an interesting title. He calls God the God of my righteousness. Anybody have any guess as to how many times in the Bible God is called the God of my righteousness? No. Ethan? One? That's correct. One time. That is it. And this is it. This is the one time in the Bible that he's called the God of my righteousness. What does that title mean that David calls him here? The God of my righteousness. Well, Spurgeon says it means that God is the author, the witness, the maintainer, the judge, and the rewarder of my righteousness. He's the, he's the God of my righteousness. In other words, David's coming to God not because of who David is, but because of who God is and what God's done for David. He's coming to God as one who was made righteous. He's the one who made him just, made him clean, made him a saint. He's the one that keeps me clean, keeps me righteous, declares me to be righteous. He's the judge. And so as David comes before the Lord, declaring the grounds for his prayer, he reminds the Lord of what he's done for his soul. He reminds the Lord that he's the one that's made him righteous. He's the one that's made him a saint. He's the one that's given him a clean heart. And so it is with us. You know, we often think in order to be a person of prayer, I got to fix myself up and then I can pray. I got to make sure that I am right, that I am righteous, and then I can come to the Lord with my prayer. Well, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But who do you go to to get righteous? You got to go to the Lord. He's the God of my righteousness. If you've sinned, you confess it to him and then, and then continue in prayer. A saint is someone, isn't someone who has never sinned. It's someone that's been made righteous, made a saint by the Lord Jesus Christ. And our grounds for prayer is not our righteousness, but his. And what he's done for us, we're robed in his righteousness. And that's a relief because we thought we had to work our way there. But... God is the God of our righteousness. He, his grounds for prayer is God's salvation. Then it's God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness. Verse 1 again, thou hast, the second part of it, thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. 
Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Here David is coming to God, looking for God to do something. And what grounds does he have to plead with God? What's the grounds of his prayer? He did it once. You did it once. You know how that friend is, that you do one thing for him one time, and now he expects you to do it every time. <laughs> and you're just like, I did it one time. I did not mean when I did it that first time that I would do that every time. Well, guess what? God will do it every time. He expects us to come back again and again and again and again. And David says, you helped me once, you enlarged me once in the past when I was in distress, so help me now. And Spurgeon writes again, David pleads past mercies as a ground for present favor. He reviews his Ebenezers and takes comfort from them. It is not to be imagined that he who has helped us in six troubles will leave us in the seventh. He trusted that God is faithful, that God's consistent that God will keep on keeping on for us. He's helped us in the past. We can expect him to help us in the present. You can trust God to do that. The Bible says in Philippians 1.6 that we are confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He begun it, he started it, Now he's going to keep working. He's going to keep at it. He's going to be faithful. And so his faithfulness is a reason for us to know that we can go to him in prayer. Then the third ground for prayer is God's mercy. God's mercy. He says, have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Have mercy on me. David acknowledged once again he wasn't worthy. Mercy is God giving us, is God withholding from us what we do deserve, the bad things we deserve. And David recognizes he doesn't deserve God's grace, he deserves God's wrath. He deserves God's judgment. The fact is that we saw this last time, what David was suffering was the reaping what he sowed a bit. It was the, some of the consequences of sin, and he deserved much worse than what was happening to him. But he said, have mercy on me. And God is merciful. And so God is merciful to David in this psalm and in, these, in this story as you read in 2 Samuel, those chapters of his running from Absalom, how God mercifully delivers him. And I just, before we get into the next point, as we look next, it's going to be his grounds for piety. You notice in verses 2 to 5, In those verses, David's going to be talking to the enemies, talking to the bad guys, talking to the ones that are seeking after his life. And do you notice the tone in which he speaks? Is he sounding scared or frightful? Is he sounding timid and shy? Is he sounding like he's he's at his wit's end and doesn't know what to do about them? No, you see his confidence. You see his boldness in the things he says to them. How does he have that boldness? Well, it's because he started off by praying. He cast his burden on the Lord. He cast all his care upon him, for he careth for you. And when he gave it to the Lord, God gave him confidence. And so now we see, secondly, his grounds for piety. His grounds for piety. And that's just another fancy word for godliness or righteousness, living right. It just starts with the letter P, so it got picked for our outline. But um, <clears throat> perhaps some would look at David's situation and they'd say, man, David, you just got to give in. I mean, God promised you that your son would sit on your throne. Absalom's your son. Time to just run and let it be. <laughs> let it be. Time to just give in. Uh, time, time to give up. Uh, uh, time, time to just... Just let the enemy go and have their way. Perhaps it was like Job's wife. Someone said, why do you maintain your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? Has the devil ever tempted you that way? Ever tempted you to 
and ask the question, why is, what's the point of continuing to be faithful? What's the point of continuing for the Lord? Perhaps a young person, he's tempted you, and may, you say, I think I just need to give in to my friend's peer pressure. Maybe it would be easier just to go the world's way, and it would be easier just to, why am I bothering living a separated life for Christ? Why, why, why am I doing this when it just causes so much trouble? And he gives you grounds and says, what are, he tries to give you reasons to give in. But David in the text, he's like, I'm not giving in. I'm not giving in to the enemy. I'm not giving in to the devil. I'm not giving in to the other side. And we see his grounds here for piety. And the first one is his regard for God. His regard for God. And in verse 2, I'm really meaning his regard for God and his disregard for the world. It says in verse 2, O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing Selah? Remember Selah, think about that. They're turning his glory into shame. It's like they're ridiculing his faith. They're making little of his God. What are they doing instead? They're loving vanity, seeking after leasing. Leasing is just an old English word for lies or falsehood. It's the idea of vain conceits, wicked fabrications. He's saying, listen, men, sons of men. The, word, the phrase sons of men refers to great men, maybe noble men, mighty men of valor. These were great guys. I think one thing we need to be clear of is in this story, when David's running from Absalom, it's not like it's the Philistines chasing him. It's not like it's the pagans who are after him. These are Israelites. These are some of the men that would have been there at the battle against Goliath. These are the ones that have been in his army perhaps the whole time. Yes, his mighty men stayed with him, and he had a group that stayed with him, but the vast masses of Israel was there with Absalom. And I believe David, in these verses that we're going to read, verses 2 to 5, he's trying to call them back to the Lord. Just think of what you're doing, what you're living for, what you're going after. It's time for you to get right with God. And he's telling them, you're going after the wrong things. You're going after vanity. You're seeking after leasing. You've believed the devil's lies. Vanity. Living for vanity. The things you're living for, just it's not worth the fight. The things you're going after, it's just not worth it. You're living your life thinking that this is what's going to make you happy, that this is what you need for fulfillment, that these things are all that matters. But the Bible says, vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. So why are you living for these foolish things when you could be going after something so much better, so much greater? You could be going after the things of God. Chrysostom, I don't know how to say his name, but an early church uh, father, I guess they call him, but back before Catholicism, but he said that if he were the fittest in the world to preach a sermon to the whole world, gathered together in one congregation, and had some high mountain for his pulpit, from whence he, from whence he might have a prospect of all the world in his view, and were furnished with a voice of brass, a voice as loud as the trumpets of the archangel, that all the world might hear him. He would choose to preach no other text than that in the Psalms. O ye sons of men, how long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing? That's the text he'd preach if he was preaching to the whole world. Hey, we know that the world needs that message. Why are you living for all these things? Why are you living for stuff that doesn't matter? But what about us today? What about Christians? What about the church? What about missionary Bible church? I wonder, will you be disregarding the world? Do you disregard the world in your pursuit of God? As one preacher said, it's sad to think how many thousands there be that can say with the preacher, vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, and they, and they swear it and yet follow after these things as if there were no other glory, but, it was, but what is to be found in these things they call vanity. 
Uh, we say it's all vanity, and yet we live for it. We strive for it. We pursue it. We make that our life's work. But David lived a pious life because he didn't regard these things. One day he was in the palace, the next he was in the wilderness. Didn't matter to David so long as he was with the Lord. He walked with God. There was a lady that uh, once said to D.L. Moody, she said, D.L. Moody, yeah, Mr. Moody, I'd like to be a Christian. I'd like you to tell me how to be a Christian, but I don't want to be your kind of Christian. And uh, D.L. Moody said, I didn't know I had a particular kind. What's the matter with my kind? And in her case, it was, well, I've always gone to the theater, and I'm far better acquainted with those people than I am with church people, and I don't, don't want to give up the theater. And D.L. Moody said, well, when have I ever said anything about theaters? We have reporters here every night. Have you seen anything in the newspaper that I have said against theaters? No. He said, then why do you bring up the subject? She said, I suppose you'd, I supposed you'd be against theaters. Well, what made you think that? Well, do you ever go? Dale Moody said, no. She said, so why don't you go to the theaters? Well, Moody said, I have something better. I would sooner go out on the street and eat dirt than do some of the things I used to do before I was a Christian. And the lady said, I, I don't understand. And Moody said, never mind. He said, when Christ has the preeminence in your life, you'll understand it all. He didn't come here to tell us we couldn't go here, couldn't go there, and lay down a lot of rules. He came to give us new life. Once you love him, you take delight in pleasing him. But if, Mr. Moody, she said, if I become a Christian, can I continue to go to the theater? He said, yes, you can go to the theater just as much as you like if you're a real true Christian, so long as you can go with his blessing. And she said, I'm very glad you're not a narrow-minded Christian, Mr. Moody. She said, he said, well, just so long as you can go there to the glory of God. If you're a Christian, you want to do whatever will please him. So D.L. Moody says that night he believes she really became a Christian. But as she walked out the door, she said to him, I'm still going to the theaters. But a few days later, she came back and she said, Mr. Moody, I understand now all that you said about it. I went the other night with a large group, but when the curtain lifted, everything looked different. I told my husband, I'm not going to stay here. He said, don't make a fool of yourself. Everyone has heard that you've been converted at the Moody meetings. Don't make a fool of yourself here in front of our friends. But I said, I've been making a fool of myself all my life. And Mr. Moody, I got up and left. And Dale Moody said, what had changed? Had the theater changed? He said, no, but she had gotten something better. And that's the thing. We have something better. The world has so much out there that it wants to attract us with, wants to allure us with. It says, come live for this. Come spend your time seeking after this pleasure, seeking after that entertainment. Come spend your life living for self and living for all these things. But the Christian has something better. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the things of God. We have so much better things to pursue. And so the Bible says, how long? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? How long will you love things that aren't important and seek after the devil's lie, the le leasing? Why not just follow the Lord? David had a regard for God, so he wasn't going to go any other way. We see his grounds for piety and his regard for God. But then another reason why David lived the way he did, secondly, was his relationship with God. His relationship with God. But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. His relationship with God. Think of that. God had chosen him. The Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. Just think, we are chosen of God in Christ. Uh, this verse speaks of our election, but just remember, our election is based on our relationship in, with Christ. It's in Christ. He chose us in Christ. Who is it that is saved? It's whosoever will. But who is it that God's elected to save? It's those in Christ. Who's in Christ? 
whosoever will, whosoever will may come. And once you come to Christ, once you put your faith and trust in him, then the Bible tells us we've been chosen in him from before the foundation of the world. And so it says, know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. You know, we think we set apart things that are precious, things that are valuable, thinking about the last verse and the vanity of things. In our house, we have collections of baseball cards and hockey cards and uh, profitless things. <laughs> but uh, my boy Nathan was going through his baseball cards the other day, and uh, he saw the guy, anybody know who's leading the league in batting average this year? His name is Bobby Witt Jr. And Nathan noticed that he had a Bobby Witt Jr. card, and I noticed the card had an RC on it, which means rookie card. I said, Nate, that's a Bobby Witt Jr. rookie card. You need to put that aside. You need to put that in a case. You can't just have that stacked with all the rest of your cards. And so this morning I go into his room and he's got Bobby Witt Jr. in a case. It's set aside. It's a precious card. It's a special card. Well, what's God set apart for himself? He set apart you and me. He set apart his people. The Lord hath set apart the godly him that is godly for himself. He's, he considers us special. The Bible says we are his peculiar treasure. It calls us a peculiar people. We always say, yeah, because we're a pretty strange bunch, aren't we? <laughs> I, my granddad would say, the gospel light attracts a lot of strange bugs. <laughs> I like that one. And then uh, he realized that we were the brain who told him that was also referring to him and them. And we're just like, oh, <laughs> we're a bunch of strange bugs. But uh, that's not what it actually means when it causes a peculiar people. It means we're his, what, his special possession. It means that we especially belong to him. Out of all the things in this world, he has claimed us as his own. We're his peculiar people, his special possession. And just thinking of the grounds for prayer, if God's chosen me for himself, if he set me apart, then of course he's going to hear my prayer. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. But David's saying, I have a special relationship with God. And uh, Christian, don't you know that you're special to God? Don't you know what it means to be his child? You say, but life has some things that aren't pleasant. Life has some things that I didn't expect. Well, have you read the end of Romans chapter eight? Sometimes we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so as his people, we have a special relationship with him. Then his grounds for piety is his regard for God, his relationship with God. And thirdly here, his reverence for God. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Think of that. He's looking at those men that are sold under sin or going the rebellious way, not even thinking about the consequences. And he says, you need to stop and think. You need to stop and think. You need to stop and consider. You know, whenever I think of that, I think of in hockey. When I was playing minor hockey growing up, they made us all put stop signs on the back of our, jer of our jerseys so that if someone's going to hit somebody, we're allowed to body check you'd see the stop sign and you'd stop and not hit them from behind. Oh, well, one day I didn't read the stop sign. And anyways, the person was fine. They turtled on me. That's what I say. But I got suspended for a game. Yes, Pastor Luke got suspended. And uh, anyways, but um, playoffs too. But stop and think what you're about to do. Well, here, how often do we go through life and we don't think? We just go, we just do. And we don't think, now is this right or is this wrong? 
Is this what God would have me to do, or should I be doing something else? Why is it that we don't stop and consider? Well, perhaps it's that we're not doing the first part of the verse. We're not standing in awe. I think that's the missing ingredient in Christianity today and all around the world is we've lost our awe of God. We've lost our reverence for him. He, we've come to consider God as an equal, as a, perhaps some even consider him as an inferior. We think of him as less than he is. So many think of him as a servant, someone that's there for them at their beck and call. And forget that he's still the one that sits on the circles of the earth and the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. He still has the nations in the palm of, span of his hand. They're like a drop in the bucket. The Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, he's still the one who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, the one at whose feet John fell down as dead before. He's still the one who makes all nations to tremble. He's still the one to be feared. Man proposes, but God still disposes. He's still on the throne. But do you have a healthy fear of God? Do you stand in awe of him? Does the thought of God cause you to consider your steps? Does it cause you to depart from evil? Are you ever still and know that he is God? Have you opened your heart to him and allowed him to make it what it ought to be? That's David's message to his enemies. Remember, these are men that he knew. These aren't the Philistines. These aren't the Ammonites or the Moabites. These are Israelites. And he's saying, guys, stop. Think of what you're doing. Think of the direction that you're going. Think of, think of what you're about to do right now. You're going the wrong way. You've got to turn around and get it right. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Just think for a moment. Stop and think. And we need to do the same thing. Because you know when I get into trouble... It's when my mouth opens and I haven't thought. <laughs> That's when I get into trouble. And when I start to do and I haven't thought. And uh, the fear of the Lord is, the, is to depart from evil. It's the beginning of wisdom. So we see his reverence for God. And then fourthly here, it's his reliance upon God. This is his instruction to these men. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. He's telling them, you got to get right with God. Get back to that altar. Get back for us. Get back to the cross and put your trust in God. These men, remember, they're just going through it without thought of God, thinking that they can do it on their own, confident in themselves. But you need to put your trust in the Lord, David says. It's the same with us. We go through life and we don't think of God and we think we can do it on our own. But we need to get back to the cross and put our trust in the Lord. We get back to him and say, I can't do it. I need the Lord's help. Lord, I need you. And put our trust in him. That's his grounds for piety. He regarded God. He had a relationship with God. He revered God. And he relied on God. See, his grounds for prayer, his grounds for piety. And then thirdly, his grounds for peace. Peace is in the last verse, but I think these... Three verses really speak of peace. I can see the men in his army there in verse number six. There be many that say, who will show us any good? What hope do we have here, they're saying? What good is this fight? How, what do we have to be so confident? David, how are you be able to sleep tonight? What makes you so peaceful in such a difficult time? Of, a difficult time? What are your grounds for peace? There be many that say, who will show us any good? It's the same in our lives. They're looking at their circumstances, looking at the things of earth, looking for, to this world for something good. But what's David's response? He's not looking to this world for something good. He's looking to the Lord. Verse 6, the middle part of it. Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. His first grounds for peace, why he's not afraid, number one, is the presence of God. The presence of God. The idea of God lifting up the light of his countenance upon us, it's the idea of entering into the fullness of God. 
It's the idea of God filling us with his spirit, giving us the fullness of himself. Now, in a world clamoring for more things, have you ever realized that what you really need is the Lord? In a world that's constantly looking for something else to fill a void, have you ever realized the void in your heart is God-shaped? As Pascal said, it's a longing that only he can fill. And more of these things isn't going to help. You need the Lord. And really, you just need more and more of him. Lift up thy countenance upon us. Give us the light of thy countenance. Give us more of thyself. More about Jesus, let me know. I like the song, Be Thou My Vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. The light of thy countenance, the presence of God. That's what we need. Then secondly, we have the provision of God. I didn't know to put provision or presence. When it says in verse 7, thou hast put glad not presence, provision or pleasure, because it says thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. But the fact is the pleasure is there because God put it there. Thou hast put gladness in my heart. It's generally believed that we get pleasure from things, don't we? I mean, if our favorite team wins, that gives us pleasure. When we see our, our boy hit the ball hard, that gives uh, hit a home run, that gives us pleasure. When we uh, are successful, we that gives us pleasure. That gives us gladness. That makes us happy. And we think that circumstances are what puts makes us happy. But the fact is, earthly circumstances they might be able to put a smile on the face, but God puts His gladness in our hearts. That has put gladness in my heart. The psalmist says, God puts it there. The world can't put it there. Things of life can't put it there. Only God is able to give you a peace, a gladness within. And so if you're looking for joy, you need to find it in the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And so David, everyone else, they had their time of corn and wine, and that was a time of harvest, a time of rejoicing. But God put a gladness that was more than that. And so we have the provision of God. And then finally, we have the protection of God. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. I can see uh, in 2 Samuel chapter, I believe it's 16, but let me read it. 2 Samuel Oh, it's chapter 17. At the end of the chapter, it says, And it came to pass when David was come to Mahanaim, that Shobai, the son of Nahash of Reba, the son of the, of the children of Ammon, and Machir, the son of Amuel of Lodabar. Anybody recognize these names, by the way? So uh, Nahash, like you, Shobai, the son of Nahash of Rabbah, the children of Ammon. That's the Ammonites that, uh, you know, David fought against. <laughs> And uh, he sent a gift when the dad died, and that's what started a whole big war. Machir, the son of Amiel of Lodabar, that's where Mephibosheth was staying. Uh, that's where he lived. And Barzillai, the Gileadite of Rogalim. I can't remember where he was earlier, if he was anywhere. But these men brought beds and basins and earthen vessels and wheat and barley and flour and parched corn. And Anyways, they brought beds. I can see the... Men standing like, why are you bringing beds? It's not like we're going to sleep tonight. <laughs> it's not like we're going to lay down and rest. Like, who could sleep when we're about to have the enemy that outnumbers us so much come and attack us tomorrow? How are we going to get any rest? But David was able to lie down and sleep because he was trusting in the Lord. As one man wrote, armed men kept the bed of Solomon, but we do not believe that he slept more soundly than his father whose bed was the hard ground, and who was haunted by bloodthirsty foes. How didn't David lie down and sleep? I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. How? Because he trusted the Lord. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. 
Philip Bennett writes, in lying down, he very voluntarily gave up any guardianship of himself. He resigned himself into the hands of another. He did so completely, for in the absence of all care, he slept. There was here a perfect trust that will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. That was David in these verses. He just gave it to the Lord. He's like, I'm not going to defend myself. The Lord will defend me. He trusted the Lord to see him through the night. And have we realized that God will see us through, that he'll bring us safely home to glory? I think of the disciples in the middle of that storm. There they were, rowing for all they were worth, bailing for all they were worth, doing everything they could to keep that ship afloat. But Jesus was on board. He was just sleeping in the hinder part of the ship. They woke him up and they said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he got up and he rebuked the wind and sea and said, Peace be still. And then he said, Why were you fearful? How is it that you had no faith? Didn't they know that when Jesus was on the boat, the boat wasn't going to sink? Didn't they know that with a master of earth and sky and sea wasn't going to lose them in the middle of the night? And it's time for us to do the same thing, to give it to the Lord. It's time for us to go to bed and give it to him. There's a story of a little girl who was having a hard time falling asleep and um, her mother was trying to encourage her to go to sleep and she said, um, and she, her mother said, um, you know, the Lord's there, the Lord will take care of you and the girl wasn't falling asleep and she looked up in the sky and she saw the moon and she said, mommy, whose, night, whose light is that? And the mother said, well, that's, the, that's God's light. And he said, well, does he put his light out? No, he never puts his light out. He doesn't go to sleep. And the little girl said, well, there's no point then in both of us being up. <laughs> she closed her eyes and she went to sleep. And uh, that's David. He's like, oh, God's taking care of me. No need for us both to be awake. And he went to sleep that night. But he was steadfast. There was an enemy coming, but didn't change his faith. He said, I'm going to just keep trusting the Lord, keep living for him. And God tells us to do the same. But be, thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God says, just keep going, be steadfast. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the time we found in your word this evening. Pray that you bless it to our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.